Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this uh, wonderful moment to be on Bill 51. Uh, but before we commence with our uh, public hearing, I, I just want to put out a couple of administrative announcements. Uh, oh, on that side, on that table over there, uh, uh, we do have the signing sheet. So if you wish to uh, testify, please, uh, because we record this, and please uh, just sign in. And if you wish to uh, do a, uh, a written testimony, I'll give you the address later on before we, uh, uh, we adjourn and, uh, and then we'll go forward. And those that are going to testify, uh, you can take your place up, up front. Usually I don't go with the, the first come first serve sign in. I just go from my left to the right or from my right to the left. Uh, yes, whatever, just, just take any seats. Uh, and this is how I do it. Uh, of course, uh, the practice is that we go with the signing seat, but I'm, I'm trying to just make it easier for, for my brain. The names on the bottom, they want to testify last. Okay, okay, that's good. So... I have, uh, I just received note, uh, notice here that Hermia, Herman, Konja, Konja, can you just raise your hand? Hermie Kenga. Oh, Kenga, is that Kenga? Kenga. Okay, King, uh, Mr. Kenga and uh, Patrick Hens. Okay, and Jerry Johnson. Okay, I think, uh, uh, these two individuals requested that they go last on the, uh, you know, their testimony. So, uh, if if I start from the left and you you're the one that requested to be last uh, giving the testimony, just raise your hand and I'll go to the other one. Okay. Once again, I I want to uh, thank you all for coming here and sharing this. Uh, moment with us. This public hearing is now called to order, and the time is about two minutes after after three o'clock. The co the Committee on Public Safety, Border Safety, Military and Veterans Affairs, Marist Council of Guam, Infrastructure and Public Transit is now conducting a public hearing today on Bill. Number 7135 ALS, an act to amend. There's a lot of amendments here, so you might, you might forget by the time I read the last one. Uh, the amend, to amend 5105, or 5101, 5105, 5107, 5109, 5112 and 5114, and to add 5119, all to Chapter 5 of Title 16, Guam Code, annotated, re annotated relative to the size, weight, and the load limitation and restrictions of certain vehicles, as introduced by my good senator here, James Mullen, on March 25th, 2019, and referred to the committee on April 8, uh, 2019. For the record, in accordance with Section 8107 of Chapter 8, Title 5, GCA, the first public hearing notice was sent out on Tuesday, May 28, 2019, to adhere to the five working days uh, requirement, and on the second public hearing, adhering to the 48 hours notice, was sent out on Friday, May 31st, 2019, and in addition to this notice, it was sent out to the media and posted on the Guam Legislature's website. Before I start, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to give the opportunity to, to the main sponsor of the bill, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Moylan, to give us a, uh, an overview of uh, the bill, Bill 71. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill 7135 seeks to amend the law associated with the weights and measurements for heavy vehicles that drive on our highway. The legislation, which is also commonly known as the TESS law, with TESS referring to the Truck Enforcement Screening Station, addresses a concern that was raised several years ago when legislation composing of extremely conservative weights and measures 
was enacted for Guam, drastically reducing the maximum weight allowed on Guam's roads would mean that importers would have to reduce the amount of goods being brought in the containers. It also means that they would have to add to their landing cost, as the amount of goods that used to fill one container would now fill possibly a container and a half. It means increasing the cost of hauling the goods from the port to the warehouse as additional trucking may be needed. Since what used to be two containers of X number of goods is now three. If the container is slightly above the maximum weight allowed, it will mean penalties. All of these are expenses are eventually added to the cost of the goods being imported, which eventually trickles itself to the consumer in the form of higher cost of goods. While we recognize the importance of having weight limits of our roads, particularly to provide the longevity of our highways, at what point do we establish measurements so low that the consumer would have to pay more at the cash register? There are many factors other than the weight limits that have resulted in our present road conditions. Thus, we had to accept this reality and not just blame everything on heavy vehicles on our roadways. Bill 7135 does require weights and measures for our roads, but it eliminates the bridge formula, which has been a questionable addition in the law, since it assumes our roads are all pretty much bridges. The legislation provides a balance which formulas established by consulting with a variety of industries who specialize in weights and measures, from wholesalers to contractors, truckers, even shippers. We have discussed this law with the intent of ultimately finding a way to reduce the cost of goods, the cost of housing, and even the cost of repairing our roads. If we can find ways to address operational expenses for entities we would enhance by allowing competition and economic factors to step right in and eventually allow the cost to be reduced. Today, we have with us those whose role is to, roll, is to work towards establishing policies which will protect our roads. But we also have the experts of several industries who shall share their concerns on the current law and propose balanced formulas through legislation which would accomplish many objectives, including the protection of our roads. I would like to thank you for joining us today, and we hope to have a healthy dialogue on Bill 7135 this afternoon, and give the people of Guam some semblance that there is a solution on the table which would help reduce the cost of goods. It may not be the only one, as we still await a hearing on Bill 9-35 to reduce the BBT, but it is the only option on the table being heard right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share my opening remarks on Bill 7135. Mr. Chairman, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Moylan. Uh, I want to recognize uh, my favorite senator uh, on my fur further left, far left rather, uh, Senator Amanda Shelton, and also and also to my immediate right, I want to recognize my other favorite senator, uh, <laughs> Senator uh, Taitagui. We can go ahead and uh, Start from the left, and if you're one of the ones that requested to be last uh, to speak, uh, just raise your hand. So, uh, who 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 uh, who are the requesters for the last, the second, and the, make sure you remind me because uh, I might I might miss out on that one. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you, Chairman, Senators, for um, allowing us to be here this afternoon. For the record, my name is Joey Salas. I'm with Ambrose Incorporated, and I'm here on behalf of our general manager, 
Tom Shimizu, who is on, um, actually off island, and I'm here to read uh, his written testimony. Um, here at Ambrose, we are in support of Bill 71. When the new bridge weight laws were implemented, it had major impact on the cost of goods for our products. For most products that come to Guam, the second major cost component after the product itself is the cost to get goods from the factory to Guam. And for our company, the bulk of our products ship from the West Coast ports of California, where there are similar bridge laws. However, the current weights are more restrictive on Guam than in California and have increased the cost to ship our products to Guam by 11%. Companies in our industry cannot afford to absorb this type of increase, so we pass the cost on to the retailer in the form of a price increase. Similarly, most retailers do not absorb price increases. Instead, the retailer will increase the retail price and the consumer pays more for the items they buy. For this reason, we are in support of Bill 71 and urge the legislature pass it. Sincerely, Tom Shimizu, General Manager, Ambrosi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Half a day. Chairman um, Pito Talahi and um, Honorable James Moyland, Senator Taro Tarigui, and um, of course, Senator Amanda Shelton. Uh, thank you for the opportunities uh, to allow me to speak today. Uh, my name is George Lai. I'm the president and owner of the Quality Distributors. Um, I live in uh, the village of Bergada and I'm a proud graduate of John F. Kennedy, 1978, the Islanders. Um, I'm here in support of the Bill 71 because the Public Law Test 33-106 passed in December 2015 had a great intention to protect our highways, roads, and streets. But however, the downside is that it becomes necessary for us to reduce the incoming cargoes, whether from the States or from the Southeast Asia or, or around the world. Um, perfect example, I used to ship four containers worth of meat, like seafood, chicken, pork, and things like that, you know. Uh, now I have to ship the fifth containers. So naturally, the land cost to Guam is up like 20%, you know. Uh, like Ambrose, um, we cannot absorb the cost, and uh, ultimately we pass it to our customers, like the hotels, the restaurants, supermarkets, and then in turn they have to raise the room rate, uh, and then um, the restaurant raise up the price, and even the supermarkets have to raise the price on like the chicken, pork, rice, oil, lunch and meat, so forth, so forth, to the consumers. So with that said, uh, I know the Bill 71 is not to kill the public law at all, you know, rather to make it amenable to work together in whole, you know, maybe raise up the uh, weight limit, allow us to bring back the weight that we supposed to. That way that will allow us like the wholesaler distributors to pass back the saving to the consumers and ultimately back to the people of Guam, you know. So um, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Hey, good afternoon, Senators. I'm Patrick Hines, uh, Assistant General Manager, Pepsi Guam Bottling. Um, I and several of my coworkers are here in support of Bill 71. We care very dearly about our roads on Guam. We have a fairly large fleet of trucks that have to travel these roads every day. When there are potholes and other things, that affects us, and we have to uh, maintain our trucks, uh, things like that. However, this uh, uh, test bill, as originally uh, passed several years ago, has also affected us uh, the same as every other wholesaler. Simple math, if I can get 26 pallets in a 40-foot container and ship it for, just say, $5,000 to throw out a round number, the way that I allocate that $5,000 is over those 26 pallets. Because of the weight law, now maybe I can only put 22 pallets in the same container. 
but the $5,000 doesn't change, so now I'm allocating the same $5,000 over less pallets, which means each pallet, each case of product, costs me more. I cannot afford to absorb that cost, so I pass it on to the retailers, as the other wholesalers have mentioned, and the retailers generally will pass that cost on to the consumer as well. So that doesn't really change for any of us. My other main issue with the original test law has to do with the bridge formula. And hopefully later, uh, Mr. Eddie Cruz will be here to tell why the bridge formula doesn't really apply to any of the bridges on Guam. Uh, again, if we care about the roads, so we don't want to do anything that's gonna cause any problems to those roads. However, the bridge formula, like I said, doesn't really apply to Guam, and, and Mr. Cruz can get into the details on that. What causes us a problem with the bridge formula is that has to do with how much weight is on each axle of the vehicle. And each axle has a limited amount of weight that's allowed to be on it. When we have our containers packed for us, wherever they're coming from, uh, west coast of the US, ports in Asia, things like that, we are counting on generally warehouse workers to fill these containers. And we have had containers that come in under the gross weight, but they fail the bridge formula, so we're still penalized for that. To adequately pass the bridge formula, the container would have to be configured in such a way that the weight is evenly dispersed on all the axles of the vehicle. There's probably a way to figure that out. It's very difficult, and even if we could figure that out with any degree of accuracy, Again, we're relying on a warehouse worker in a port somewhere far away to be able to follow that. Their main goal is to get the container loaded and off of their dock and to us as quickly as possible. So they don't really have an incentive to follow that, again, even if we could. We've been given some relief since the bill was passed. There are waivers where we can bring in containers that are higher than the original weight. That has helped us out quite a bit and we are also able to offload heavy containers and uh, put them in another vehicle, which helps a little bit, which is why prices maybe haven't increased as much as they would had the bill been implemented in its uh, full force. So in summary, yes, we will see higher prices. We've already seen some of them, but they will continue to go up with full implementation unless Bill 71 is passed and the bridge formula is very, very complicated for us, and I will say next to impossible for us to be able to uh, work around to be able to bring containers in that are even under the gross weight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, you mentioned uh, the, the bridge formula, and I, I guess the bridge formula that we have right now is under federal standard. It, it, it's a federal standard that doesn't happen to apply to any of the bridges that we have on Guam. Okay, and I was hoping that the uh, uh, Department of Public Works can, can be here today because I, have, I do have uh, several questions that I want to ask them and also revenue tax. And you didn't mention the, the bridge formula and the reason why we, uh, uh, we continue to have the, the federal standard on the bridge formula. And I, I was wondering how come we haven't uh, done our, our own bridge formula for Guam. Do you know? I, I don't know the, uh, the people that were responsible for drafting the original law. Uh, I believe just took it based on some existing uh, laws from the United States and didn't really adapt them well enough for Guam to match our circumstances here. Thank you very much. Sure, Chairman, uh, can, can I um, say something? The bridge formula, um, I think it was designed for like the state, like the Golden Gate, like the Brave Bridge. We have none of those in Guam, you know. The only uh, bridge we have from the south to north coming to like Harmony Industrial Park is the Agandia Brave, you know, the bridge. I think it was like fixed and built nicely. Uh, to reiterate, you know, we talk about the formulas like based on the tractor to the trailer, X01, two, three, four, five. It is very complicated, you know. Uh, if you do ship containers with one single item, single weight, single dimension, yeah, it could be done evenly. But most of our, our food products, like the meat, 
we have chicken, we have pork, we have fish. You know, same container might have like 20 to 30 different items. They all come in different sizes, different cube, different weight. So it's possible for us to balance them out from X01, two, three, four, five. I think the important thing is the overall weight, the gross weight. If it's like 90,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, or 110,000 10,000 pounds, just make sure like the gross weight is below, you know, the allowable weight and things like that, you know. So uh, I, I, I'm with him, you know, the bitch formula does not work for Guam, you know. Thank you. And, and the only reason why I kind of raised that is because, you know, some of the bridges here in Guam is not considered bridges. And some of the, some of the things that covers the road is considered uh, coverts. So we need to un really understand that if we do have covers, we need to, to uh, really uh, test those covers and make sure that they can sustain the, the heavy load of those trucks coming, going over the roads. So uh, you, you well, right I'm going to work on that. Uh, yeah. I'm going to try to find ways to have our own, uh, and I'll invite you guys again to come and uh, uh, give me your insight in as far as what we need to do in as far as bringing about uh, the, the standard uh, for our roads in as far as uh, more heavy loads. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Jose Peter Terlai, Senator James Moylan, Senator Tello Taitigui, and Senator Amanda Shelton. Half a day and good afternoon. My name is Hermie Keha, and I am the general manager for Micronesian Brokers Inc., an affiliate of the Jones and Guerrero Company. I'm here to, with my colleagues to provide a written testimony in favor of amending Public Law 33-106 and in support of the passage of Bill 71-35. Micronesian Brokers, known as MBI, is a wholesale distribution company which imported in 2018 nearly 300 containers of consumer goods into our island of Guam. And for over 45 years, MBI has provided products and services to Guam's food service and retail operators. <clears throat> As a distributor of fast-moving consumer goods, we are an intermediary or a middleman for our customer's supply chain. Distributors such as MBI, Quality, Pepsi, PepsiCo uh, purchase goods from our manufacturers. We store them in our warehouse facilities and then resell these goods to the retailers and food service operators. MBI imports dry and frozen goods on a weekly basis from the, United, from the US mainland, New Zealand, Australia, and Asia. And on the dry side, we import sugar, rice, canned corned beef, and UHD milk, just to name a few. Whereas on the frozen side, we import frozen beef, poultry, seafood, dairy products, and many other frozen products that we sell to our customers. You know, in the, in the logistics world, it can be a good thing to be heavy, particularly when it comes to containers. Overweight containers, we know, are not allowed to travel across certain streets and highways in California, but they have a home in what we call overweight corridors. For example, in the Port of Oakland, the overweight corridor provides overweight trucks with a route to legally transport cargo containers from a consolidator to the port itself. MBI, our company, utilizes the overweight corridor to consolidate and load our frozen beef, poultry, and seafood products into a reefer container. The benefits of utilizing the overweight corridor cannot be overstated. It keeps the cost of goods down. If the weight requirements as mandated by Public Law 33-106 were to be enforced today, wholesalers, those of us here, would have to significantly reduce the amount of cargo in a reefer container by as much as 18%. That's approximately 9,500 pounds. Simple math will tell you that as the load capacity decreases, the cost of goods increases. Instead of spreading the cost over a large load, the cost is now absorbed by a lesser load, thus increasing the landed cost of goods for each item. And the increased cost of goods is then passed on 
to the retailer and food service operators, which eventually is reflected on the shelves. Ultimately, the consumer, you and I, bear the burden of paying more at the cash registers. Fortunately, DPW allows wholesalers to apply for a test permit, enabling companies to import cargo at a higher load capacity. However, the test permit is only valid for a 90-day period and renewable thereafter. Amending Public Law 33-106 would be the better solution. Thus, we're in favor of amending the law through our support of Bill 71-35, as it addresses the following. One, modernizing the existing law relative to size, weight, and load limitations of vehicles. Two, protecting and preserving our roadways. And three, reducing the cost of imported goods, especially food items. So how would the current law Public Law 33-106 impact our island residents if the law is not amended? The answer is simple. Commodities that you buy at your favorite grocery store will become even more expensive. It's already expensive. We all know the difference between buying goods outside the fence and seeing what it costs inside the fence. As a wholesaler, let me share with you a few of the consumer goods we're importing today which will increase in cost if weights and measures aren't adjusted. Rice, we bring in jasmine rice. I won't say the brand name, but we bring in jasmine rice. You wanna hear it, Senator Chaw? Yeah, everybody buy Royal Harvest jasmine rice. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, now you know. Uh, you know a 25 pounder and a 50 pound, 50 pound bag, if we were to reduce the weight, the weight limitation, that would, the cost of those two size bags would increase by a factor of 18%. In other words, a 50 pound sack of rice, our, our Royal Harvest Jasmine rice, right now it sells at $37.99. I know it's expensive, but it's wonderful quality of rice. But because of reducing the weight, the cost of that bag of rice would go up to $44.77. Sugar. A 1 kg or 2 kg would increase by a factor of 25%. 2 kg retailing at 249 would now cost you and me $3.09. Chicken thighs, everybody loves chicken thighs. We're bringing that in a container and, and I'm sure um, um, George will attest to this, right? That because of the, by reducing the, the weight in the container, the cost would increase by a factor of 21%. So you'd be paying an additional five, six, seven cents more per pound. I, would, I could go on to cite other examples, of, but the point is clear, Senators. As the load in a container decreases, the cost of goods will increase, whether you like it or not. Bill 71-35, as written, strikes the right balance. Our highways are protected with the correct adjusted weights and measures, and hopefully this whole bridge formula is eliminated. And in return, the cost of goods entering our island are not negative, negative to, negatively impacted. Senator Terlahi, Senator Moylan, Senator Taitagui, and Senator Shelton, we urge you to do the right thing for our island residents by supporting the passage of Bill 71-35. Thank you, and Suzuki Masi. Thank you very much. I just wanted to, because I'm kind of, when I was reading the bill, uh, for the last four years, there's not been any weight and measure done by DPW. So I'm... Uh, the, in the last two years, uh, the Senator. The last two years or four years? July, July of 2017. I, I it was four years. They started. And this is why I wanted Reverend Tax for One and DPW to, to come by here so that they can explain uh, the shortfalls of, uh, of the longevity of making sure that we do have those equipments to make sure that, you know, whatever we put out on the road is within, you know, the standard, with, you know, to... Uh, to so that the roads can uh, sustain 
uh, whatever load, uh, whatever uh, loads we have. So this is why I wanted revenue and tax. Uh, and when, as I as I was reading the bill, and I want to thank my good senator here for for that bill because I am. It's a good bill. I'm telling you, it's a good bill. However, we need to do some legal ramification on that bill, like some of the amendments that we need to do and things like that. So I just want to make sure that you know the. The public is protected also. The, the other vehicles out there is protected, and even the driver, and even the, if there is an accident on the truck load, uh, I wonder, maybe there's a suit that's going to go on with, with the company. So I just want to be sure that everybody's protected on this one. Sir, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman Terlahi and other distinguished senators. My name is Jerry Johnson, and I'm the president of Hawaiian Rock Products. I'm here to testify in support of Bill 71-35. First of all, Public Law 33-106 was passed without an economic impact study. The senators of the uh, 33rd legislature did not have enough input from the Guam transportation companies before passing this law it, late in their term. The law mirrors the federal vehicle weight law that only applies to the U.S. interstate highway system, the federal highways. That's why, as Hermes said, they are able to transport their goods in the U.S. on other roads that have higher weight limits and not the interstate highways that have large bridges on them and large heavy traffic. So that is the difference between the mainland and Guam. The complex formulas that are included in the law, especially the bridge formula, make it difficult to determine how these companies would be affected. It was only when the test truck weight system on Route 11 from the port was open that they discovered the full impact, impact and how it would affect the cost of goods imported into Guam and the delivery of construction materials to projects on Guam. For Hawaiian Rocks products, the major supplier of ready mix concrete and asphalt pavement to the constru construction industry, it had a severe impact. Our ready mix concrete trucks and dump trucks were previously designed to deliver materials to projects in the villages. They have a short wheelbase in order to be able to maneuver the sharp turns and narrow roads. The new law has required us to order new trucks that are substantially longer with more axles to comply with the bridge formula and deliver the same amount of material in a single truckload that we were able to deliver before. If you look at the pictures, if you have my testimony of the difference in the trucks. We already have some of the new trucks on the island and they used to have three axles in our trucks. Now they have seven with a long trailer axle on the back. And these, road, these trucks are out on the road already. Not all of the ones we've ordered, but uh, the first batch of them. Um, where was I? Um, a, a concrete truck for example, a ready-mix truck that we could previously deliver nine cubic yards of concrete would only be able to deliver six cubic yards in order to comply with Public Law 33-106, substantially increasing our delivery costs if we have to reduce the weight on those trucks. A dump truck that could deliver 25 tons of aggregate or asphalt concrete can now, would now only be able to deliver 14 and a half tons. See, that the, see the attached photos. The addition of the bridge formula is important to the U.S. mainland where there are long span bridges and not, should not apply to Guam where mostly are short culvert like bridges, which the chairman mentioned. In the northern half of the island, there aren't any bridges at all. Um, and so why would, it, why would the bridge formula apply to the northern half of the island? In order to com comply with Public Law 33-106, Hawaiian Rock has purchased about 50 new trucks in the last few two years at a cost of over $12 million. The purchase cost of these new trucks is about 25 to 30 percent more than the trucks that we had formerly purchased. We already have to pass this, these costs on to our customers who are building housing, military projects, commercial projects, and roads. These new trucks will increase the traffic congestion and safety concerns because of their increased length. Um, the new uh, proposed law 71-35 will actually not now substantially benefit Hawaiian rock products because we've already spent the money 
to comply with Bill 33-106. It will, however, benefit the 400 employees and their families of Hawaiian Rock Products by keeping the costs that these other gentlemen had mentioned down. And that's my major concern because, you know, we'll have to pay them more to be able to just survive because of these in increased costs. Um, It is, if the real concern is about the condition of the roads or bridges, then more budget money has to be put into the maintenance and repair of this infrastructure. A typical life stand in the U.S. of the type of thin friction layer that we place on our roads for the, for the uh, non-skidding function, the friction course, is only seven to ten years. That's typically how long those, those thin lift asphalts last. I've attached a list of all the roads in Guam and the year that they were paved with the friction course pavement. Most of these roads have not been resurfaced for 15 to 25 years. In addition, the new pavement specified in our contracts that are being enforced now is really not suitable for Guam's weather conditions. However, additives can be added that will increase the life of the pavements. And finally, Public Works and their consultant are looking at adding those additives uh, specifically the tri-intersection that is, is in very bad shape and was only recently paved um, three or four years ago. They're gonna, they are going to, they've contracted us to try these new additives on that intersection. The big problem is at the intersections where you have the concrete layer underneath and a thin lift of, of one inch asphalt on top and the, and, the tr and the trucks and other vehicles make turns at the intersections and the turning motion and the, the specifications for the asphalt cause all the problems. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ed, uh, Mr. Cruz, are you going to read all this? No, I, I, I'm basically here to answer questions. There's a lot of stuff. Oh, okay. Because this there's is a lot of stuff uh, that aren't in layman's terms. So if there's anything you don't understand or whatever, as an engineer and a business person, been involved in transported goods all my life on island basically um, you know I <laughs> I, I could say that I, I have experience to help help you people make the right decision okay so so with the uh, the lengthy uh, testimony here written testimony if you can permit me that I will pass this on to sure my I, colleague. I, I have another copy and, uh, you yes please do and then uh, uh, because I'm gonna go ahead and after this we do have uh, uh, the recordings and everything and I will pass this on to the rest of my colleague. And let me tell you, I'm telling everybody here that it is a good bill. I'm just a little bit concerned about the roadways that we have that has not been uh, uh, really uh, or met the, uh, the standards of heavy load. So we I have confidence sure. that you guys will do the right thing. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cruz. At this point in time, I wanna give the opportunity to uh, my colleagues to ask questions if they have. Uh, I'll, we'll go ahead with uh, my favorite senator, Senator Amanda Shelton. Sejus Masi, Mr. Chair, and Sejus Masi, everyone, for being here today. I don't have any questions for the panel here today. I was really hoping, as you were too, that a DPW, a representative, would be there. I understand their director is off-island, but I was hoping for a representative to answer some questions, especially uh, with regards to our federal highway funds and uh, those type of things. So I think we'll wait to do the work in the committee, but I do appreciate all of the testimony before us. Uh, uh, I too am very concerned about the rising cost of our goods and services, so I very much appreciate what you had to say today, Sejus Masi. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I guess uh, the Senator on my right wants to go before the main sponsor of the bill. Sorry, <laughs> Legend. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, we like to leave the sponsor of the bill last so he can make his comments. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time out today to be here uh, for this public hearing uh, on this bill. Um, and I look around and see so many people who have families and, and siblings here, you know, that uh, provide food on their tables, you know, and one of the things I'd like to ask, I guess, let me start with you, Hermie, if this bill were to pass, you talk about how the, um, 
how this is going to change the, the cost of products on Guam. So if this bill were to pass, is MDI willing to lower the prices? We would lower our price as long as we don't get any increases from our suppliers. Um, so the answer to your question, yes. Uh, right now, uh, we have to do a, a number of things, a, ju a few juggling acts here. And that is because of the test permit, um, we're still a bit overweight, so we have to go and offload the excess as, as Mr. Patrick Hines just mentioned, you know, that uh, whatever additional overweight uh, that you've got, we have to go to an, a separate facility, mm -hmm. you know, and then arrange for another delivery truck to be there and get some more wholesale, more uh, 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 warehouse folks to come in and offload that and then go back through the scale. So it's a bit of inconvenience so, right now. So thank you so much, Harry, yeah. for that. So Patrick, if this bill were to pass, would Pepsi be lowering their prices? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't seen the full impact of the original bill. There are permits which allow us to bring in heavier containers than the original bill calls for. And as Hermie mentioned, we're able to offload to minimize the impact to us. So what I can say is if this bill does not pass and the original bill is, is put into full force, prices will certainly go up. We will uh, reduce prices if economic conditions permit us to. We always want to keep things low. Plus, we have competition. We can't just charge whatever we want to for anything. So uh, to the extent we're able to, absolutely, we want to have the lowest price possible. One, one thing that I'm concerned about that, remember when the GRT went up, um, a lot of the prices of cost of goods went up as well. And there was a time where it actually went from from 4% to 6%. And then it went back to 4%. But the prices did not go go down as well. I so worked at Payless at the time uh, as their controller. Yeah, I remember. And when that got uh, rescinded, we actually did lower our prices immediately. That's great. That's great for Payless for doing it, but the majority of other businesses did not. So I, I support you know, this bill, anything to help lower the cost of goods on this island, which is so expensive. I mean, people think Hawaii is expensive to live. Guam is just as expensive uh, to live. So, uh, Mr. Cruz, um, I know you're an engineer, and <laughs> a, I'm a great Facebook fan of yours as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what about the military buildup? You know, all well, these come from port going all the way to Finnegan, and do they have to comply with this? If you read the law, it says, and it, 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 it mirrors federal law, which says that federal and state governments are exempt. So that means they can break the law any day of the week, however they want, with no repercussions. Um, you know, when Glenn Leon Girl was DPW director, he made every effort to comply to show us in good faith that whatever affected us affected him. So I saw their loads basically decrease. Now, I, of course, I never was there to, to weigh them, but you could see the capacity of what they carried in their dumb trucks and some of their trucks. So, so federal government and um, state governments are exempt. Now, let me tell you something that's in the works, probably something you're not aware of, but the military buildup does have a plan to do uh, upgrading of roads for the extra weights. Um, I met with them at one time and they were talking about moving M1 Abraham's tanks that were like 65 tons, about 130,000 pounds, which is way over the weight limit. And they are exempt, but their idea was that because um, they needed to move those vehicles safely, they were willing to ride into the military buildup plan an upgrade of the highway. So that their plan is to build one lane going north, one lane going south, to strengthen that for, for about 200,000 pound loads. So that, that's a good thing there. They're also looking at, uh, I met with Brady from uh, WSP, which is the consultant for DPW, and there are plans to upgrade the bridges. Uh, most of those are just the bridges from the south, from Naval Station all the way up to Anderson and Nick Tams. Of course, in the northern part, we don't really have bridges, but that includes uh, all the ones south of Agania. So th that's, that's a really good plan, and that's a, that's a good sign that, at least for commerce from the port 
to Harmon or Anderson or wherever it needs to go, a majority of the commerce, we can allow that. We, we wouldn't impede commerce and the cost would not come up because our roads would be safe as long as they're restricted to those lanes, there should be no impact. But to be honest with you, you can go to the back road of uh, Route 15 and you can see that road. Most of that road is just an overlay. They just overlaid asphalt over the old asphalt. Those roads for nearly 20 years carried overweight trucks carrying aggregate in preparation for the military buildup. And there's very little to any sign of wear. And the only places that really show any wear are places where the government never enforce their, their laws and their requirements of repairing utility repairs and, and utility encroachments, mm. you know, properly. So those areas that you see repairs around, they're all falling apart. So I think the, the intent here is not only protect our roadways, but to provide maintenance. And, you know, I just read the territorial auditor's report this last week about how funds were moved around. And it, it just alarmed me that the legislature intended to have these funds specifically to protect these highways. But yet, the executive branch decided it was needed, you know, it was more of a priority to move it somewhere else, public health, perhaps, or Guam Memorial Hospital, which I can't blame him. You know, he, he claims the right of organic act, but I think that this legislature needs to hold whoever the executive officer's feet to the fire and say, hey, we intended it for this purpose, Please use it for that. If you need money for something else, come see us and we'll work with you. And I think that's the spirit of the law. Thank you, Eddie, for that. And um, so just to debrief uh, from the question I asked, that you're saying that the military is, is exempt, so they can have their big trucks Absolutely. coming from the port all the way to Finnegan, and they will not have to comply. So does that mean that, Mr. Johnson, your company, that if you have a contract with the military and they're utilizing your trucks, it's still considered exempt because no. they're carrying loads from you? No, the, only there, there's if it's a, a There's a fine vehicle. line there, Senator. And if by chance they hired Hawaiian Rock to carry their product that they had and they owned, then it would be exempt. If they were purchasing a product from Hawaiian Rock, or if Hawaiian Rock had a contract to provide con concrete to a certain military building, then they are not exempt. That's the fine line there. Okay. Well, I, I do agree with you with regards to like special funds that we have in the government that's set aside for particular things like Healthy Futures Fund. And one of them is the Highway Fund. There's quite a bit of money in there, but it's always seemed to be rated for something else other than for our roads, and then maybe we can address that issue by, you know, staying the course on what these funds are for. And I know that my good colleague, the author of the bill, is also, he's a great advocate on special funds staying the course what it's intended to be. So we're going to work closely together to make sure that highway funds stays to highway funds. And, and hopefully that this bill does become law that we have these companies here who will uh, listen to the cry of the people of, you know, costs being so high that you will lower your prices if this bill passes. Senator, can I just include something? Um, most people don't realize how important highway funds are. But if you look at uh, past studies with the uh, Department of Public Works Office of Highway Safety, they work with the federal government in identifying crucial areas that are, uh, have high number of accidents, uh, most of them fatalities. If you look at places as recent as uh, Agate there by the bridge, there was a you know, couple of fatalities that happened there very recently. Uh, there are other places on, in the Yilauan area where the friction surface is already worn so bad it's very slippery under uh, you know, rainy conditions. So those are, you know, people don't realize that it's just as important to protect our highways and make them safe as it is to provide funds for the Guam Moral Hospital. So I think that's something that people don't, don't realize and I just wanted to stress that importance. So, you know, in the future, maybe we can reinforce the Office of Highway Safety and maybe even move motor carrier over there or maybe even the test facility and make them work in conjunction so we keep the trucks on our highway safe. Thank you and thank you so much. So there is no one from Revin Tax that's here? Okay, and nobody from DPW as well. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Create a great day. Thank you, Ed.
Go ahead, Senator Moynihan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in our committee meetings with our, our group here, we did have the opportunity to talk with DPW a few times. I uh, appreciate if you can bring to light some of our conversation, Mr. Cruz, with what their objections would have been if they were here to testify with us today, please. Well, you know, I got, I got pretty much attacked because the only real engineers to the, to the whole argument was myself and, and probably uh, Brady uh, from Parsons Brinkerhoff, which is now known as WSP. What, what, uh, what they were really concerned was because they were so involved with the highways that they wanted to build these highways in a safer manner and, and an, a manner in which they met the budget, whatever the budget was. So if we needed to improve a highway, you know, everything from engineering, architectural design and everything, all the way to the ribbon cutting met within that budget. And so, in essence, what I saw was there were some things that were left out, some things that weren't as high priority. And one of them I need to mention is uh, the Route 8 intersection. If you look at the design of that, and if you go to anywhere in the United States, and, and uh, especially we're talking about larger vehicles now that we have to comply with the law, the radiuses of the, of the turning area are so short on our highways that that's where the scrubbing is involved. The, the, the longer the vehicle, the bigger the area you have to turn. If there's not enough ample turn, you need to go in the oncoming lane or, or somewhere near the median. And so we, we had worked on design like that, and the biggest argument was that, whereas I was blaming the radiuses and DPW was talking about the weights of the vehicles. Well, everybody knows that if you have a pound of beef here and a pound of beef there, that the impact it puts on this table is exactly the same. Now, if you have five pounds of beef and it's spread over a bigger area, it has a less impact on the actual surface because it's spread out in a bigger area. So we had the argument of, well, okay, we agree. We add more tires, more axles to the vehicle. It puts less weight on certain areas of the roadway. So it poses less, less friction, less damage to the roadways. But what wasn't discussed properly was that when you increase a, a vehicle, you now make it overweight because you're adding extra things on it. And so when you do that, then by law, you have to reduce the capacity of whatever goods you're trying to deliver. So now it takes two, two extra vehicles or two vehicles instead of one to carry the same amount of cargo. And that's where your consumer costs come up. So additionally to that, there's extra traffic, of course. You've got more vehicles. Uh, you got more registration fees, so the costs are just exploding, and nobody really keeps track of that. Nobody really understands that except for these gentlemen down here that at the end of the day have to write a check for everything and figure out how much we have to sell this product. That's exactly what's happening when you ask a question, Senator Tidegui, about are the costs going to come down? It, if you just directly look at what the current trend is now, and the current costs, I would have to agree, the costs will come down. But when you start talking next week or the week after about increasing the BPT or a sales tax or minimum wage or something, then you have to understand that they can't bring the cost down. So this is a, a kind of a, a formula that we all have to figure out which one do we want. You know, we have, I think that the main objective to that question is how can we make the lower wage earners survive in a world where, you know, the gap between here and here is so great? These people up here are not worried about costs. They have more than enough money. It doesn't affect them as much. But this poor guy down here that's right on the, you know, poverty level is deciding, am I going to go rob a game room so my baby can have milk? Or am I going to... Uh, you know, find an extra job, or how am I going to balance this out? And that's the problem our community has. And so going, going back to the whole thing with, with uh, highways, we were trying to figure out, Brady and myself, just, just out of minds, how can we balance this out? 
You know, of course, they want to get their money they get for consulting and construction management. We want to get our safe highways. You know, how do we balance this out? How do we, how do we keep this, this thing going where we can't have a community we can afford? And so that was actually the biggest argument. Uh, in fact, I saw him Sunday and he said, you know, he was studying a community in California that what they did was they added half percent on a sales tax because that had less effect on the community than it would be to do other things to enforce stricter laws or, or increase a cost somewhere else uh, to protect their highways. So those are, those are options you, you people, you folks need to look at. You know, what do we need to do to balance this out? And so I think that's the biggest argument. It's not an argument whether uh, DPW is against us or whatever, because Glenn Leon Guerrero told us years ago that his job was not to fight us, but to enforce the laws as the senators and the governor puts into motion. So I think that's, that's the fine line, Senator, and if you can find that sweet spot, and we can all agree on something, which I think, you know, especially as residents of this great territory, I think that uh, we'll make it a better place for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Uh, on the wholesaler side, can you explain to me if you experienced some of the penalties that have already been charged when you're bringing your goods, if it's overweight or not in the right, right uh, measurements there? Uh, just for examples, you know, um, we used to ship like maybe 50,000 pounds of meat inside the containers, and now we have to reduce it down to about 44,000 to like 46,000. But then yet, it's the bridge formula that gets us. Uh, the overall weight is within the limit, but however, like I told you, within the same containers, you know, I might have like beef, chicken, and pork, different size, different cube, and things like that. So therefore, sometime, most of the time that we are within the limit of the gross weight, but then we fail on maybe exit two or three or four and so on. Uh, it, it's expensive, you know. Just for example, maybe like uh, over 1,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds, you know, it could cost us more than like $1,000 for like a citation, you know, at one time. And if you have 10 containers, that's what, more than $10,000, you know. 100 containers, $100,000, you know. And, and the money, honestly, I don't know where it goes to, but then like uh, it goes to some kind of fund, you know, that the DPW uh, set up and things like that, you know. Are you offered the opportunity to shift the weights of the containers before taking it out? On well, um, yes or no, you know, sometime like uh, if we got notice before the uh, weight station, we actually send one of our trucks or a couple guys over there and offload some of the weight. But then again, you might able to offload the weight in the front, the nose, but then it's a 40 foot container, you know, so it's kind of hard to go into the 20 foot, 30 foot to kind of balance the weight and things like that. On a sunny day like this, yeah, maybe it's possible, but we all know that sometimes there's rain, typhoon, storm, and things like that, you know. So it makes it really troublesome, you know, logistical-wise, you know, for us to handle that kind of situation, you know. But uh, again, the, the shipping container itself, if you read the tariff rate, they're good for over 60,000 pounds, you know. So uh, we, we, we're placing at the disadvantage in Guam, senators. They don't have such law in Saipan, Palau, or other islands as well, you know. So we kind of shoot ourselves into our foot, you know, by doing so, you know. What's, what's the worst penalty that you would receive if you violate this, these conditions for multiple times? Uh, I think if I read the law correctly, if you maybe three or four times they can take away your license and stop your business and things like that, you know. Yeah. And how many people do you employ? Uh, at Quality, we got about 80 employees, yes. So you're saying the current law, will, if you violate it, at, at the third time, you would lose your business license and you had to close down your business? Yeah, if, you, if they go strictly by the law and things like that, you know. Yes, sir. Um, Cruz, they also talk about federal funds, that if we don't follow what we're supposed to do, they're going to take away our highway funds. You know, that's a big fallacy, Senator, because... Uh, at the very beginning, we were told that, and Senator Tom Adda told us the same thing, that we'd have to write a check back to the federal government and give the money back. So I went to uh, communicate with Washington, D.C. first with the Federal Highway uh, Transportation, and then uh, Department of State and Department of Interior and everybody else to try to find out if there's any truth to the matter. 
So I had asked uh, also Congressman uh, Berdayo to look into this thing, and, and uh, all of us, none of us could figure it out. In fact, Governor Guam does have a letter that says it's not tied to it. So based on that letter, wherever it was written or who it was written to, um, there, there is no truth to that, that, that uh, highway funds are not related to, in any way to highway regulations. I, I would agree with you, and especially if we had the military coming on over here, I don't think they're going to remove any of our federal funds for the, for the defense exactly. of our island and our nation. Exactly, and that's what, basically what they told me. They said, why would we want to do that? You know, most of the funds we provide for your highways are aid to the territory. It's not related to, you know, whether we have a military base there, or it's not a, a form of agreement like a compact maybe, or commonwealth status, or anything. The, 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 the money is given there mutually so we can both do what we need to do on the, in the territory. Them, the military, to provide transportation for their, facil for their equipment and for us to pr promote commerce. You know, we, we still have the Jones Act <laughs> to work with, so there's another thing. So they, they can understand that the costs of living on Guam are so high, uh, sometimes based on federal mandates or, or federal restrictions. And so when I had met with them, they said, you know, we, we can't see anything. Uh, if there is a law, you know, it's so far deep in the books that most of us aren't aware of. So I had asked, you know, basically everybody, and when I had asked uh, Senator Adda before he moved to the Guam Airport Authority, he, he said he, he didn't see anything, you know, in writing per se, that he was relying on what was told to him. And that's what he told me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Chairman, I have no other further questions there. Anybody else up here? Anyone in the audience wants to uh, give out the, their words of wisdom? Go ahead, sir. Senators, can I add to just the question that Senator Moyland um, uh, asked about the penalties? I brought with me the test worksheet and we bring in sugar for the bakeries. We're talking about 25 kg, right? So the whole container is nothing but 25 kg sugar. Um, and those are loaded in a 20 footer container, okay? So we talked about axle weights, the tandem axle weights as well as, as, well as the bridge formula. So we got hit on both areas. So on the, on the scale side, we were good on axles two and three. That's just right behind the track, the driver, right? So that's where the container latches onto the tractor, right? But, and that, we were at 26,400 pounds, and the legal weight limit is 34,000 based on the current law 33-06. However, on axles four and five, our, our weight, the weight was, 39,340 pounds. So we went over by 5,340. Now, think about it. The, the same number of bags loaded in, in that container is, is basically level from nose to door. What happens is that when the container gets latched onto the tractor, all of a sudden, all that weight gets shifted to the rear, right? And, and consequently, you're, you're in violation. And because of the bridge formula, we're, we're also in violation by over 9,300 pounds. So the question is, how much do we get fined for this? And as Senator, as George Sly mentioned, you know, strike three, you're, you lose your business license. So the first time, first time we're, the first violation would be $2,825, okay? Just for 5,000 pounds over. The second offense, $5,400, and then to top it off, the third violation, $7,975. So that's, what, that's what's bearing down on, uh, on those of us who are wholesalers, trying to bring these products in, these commodity products for our, you know, for our customers, and yet because of the, the law that was um, passed back in December of 2015, which pretty much mirrors, you know, the California laws, right, without actually doing, 
you know, the research and seeing what impact it will have on this community here in Guam, um, this is quite serious. And so who can, if you were a small time operator, small business, you'd go underwater real quickly. Your business would be shut down. So if we pass this uh, bill 71, Am I correct to say that everybody that testified today would be satisfied? Absolutely. Can I say something, Senator? In support of Herbie, he's talking about the weights. When we formulated this new bill, we went as a panel and examined everybody's violations, all the test data that was given to us from DPW and the test facility operators, and we looked at the violations. Of course, you're going to get a couple that are very flagrant, right? Just out, out of this world that we can't cover. But 98% of what was in violation is covered on this new bill. So we would be within the legal thing. We wouldn't have hassles with, uh, and, you know, and, and, and all these guys are very close. They're, I mean, they're within... 500 or 1,000 pounds of each other. So you can't blame it on, maybe it's the Asian containers that come in. Maybe it's the ones from Seattle, or maybe it's the one from Houston. It's every container that comes in. So what does that tell you? There's something else that's involved with this formula that's beyond our control. And part of it is the maritime laws which govern how much weight you can put on this, and also the outside factors, like what is the weight allowed in California? What is the lo load weight allowed in Seattle? So by designing this bill the way we did, we're trying to basically satisfy the masses while still provide enough relief that it doesn't impede on so much commerce that it drives the cost of goods skyrocketing. You can see 5,000 pounds, $5,000 fine, that's what, a dollar a pound? What if you got a, a steak that's $7.99? Now it's $8.99. You know, what if you got a sack of rice? 50 pounds. Now it went up again. You know, that's, that's pretty serious. So, in essence, to your question, it would drive people out. And we, we try in our community to promote small business. Both small business can't absorb that. Yeah, sure, the bigger guys like Home Depot, uh, maybe even pay less, or somebody that has different commodities that can package them and mix them in a container so that the light things go with the heavier things and, and yet meet that happy median, they might be able to, to beat the system. But the poor guys that bring in only rice, they're dead in the water. So that's what we're, we're talking about here, you know? I mean, you can mix concrete with styrofoam and kind of get a happy median where the container is within a reasonable amount and passes through the test, but if you're all, your business is only hauling concrete like Hawaiian rock, they've got to bring in these special trailers, uh, you know, whatever to accommodate for them. And if it was a little guy, like when Paris Brothers first started out, or maybe even uh, the company just sold out to Smithbridge, um, J Planning or whatever their name was at the end, but that little bit can make and break a little guy very easily. So that's something we have to consider also, you know, the, the economics of the little guy versus the big guy. But I think that Hermie hits the spot where we can't really decide whether it's the, the front two axles or the back two axles, because even the length of the truck that pulls it, even the container, uh, basically we only have two container sizes on Guam, a 20-footer and a 40-footer. So if you look at our bill, we broke up two trailer sizes to try to kind of meet some kind of a, a load limitation based on length. So that kind of helps the bridges a little bit. And most people don't understand if you multiply one times this and T over S or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty tough math. So it could be very complicated. I wish Gina and Goku was here right today because uh, she told a story to our panel one day where Three different people had three different calculations of the test facility. So, you know, when, you, when you're when you dealing with people's lives and, and, and fines like that, that can be pretty, pretty alarming. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. I would like 
Does any of the senators want to bring up something? Huh? Okay, okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to thank all the panel that was here today and all the uh, support from the employees. Thank you for taking your time out. I appreciate your great support. Um, though the original public law 33106 it was passed without an economic study, I think what we're hearing today is better than any economic study. We understand now what this bill has done, and we found a solution, and that's Bill 7135. Without dragging out anything or repeating anything that has to be said, I, I think your interest is, is, uh, is important to the people of Guam, that you want to maintain the cost of goods, be it affordable, and you want to maintain your business and keep on running. You want to support your employees as well. So I appreciate your, your best interest, the best interest in the community, you as a stakeholders who live here and have your families here, and we only want the best for our island. So I see the total support that you have given, given to us. And, Maybe I can ask for the, uh, the voice of the uh, audience here. If you agree with this bill and not having everybody the opportunity to talk, if you want to give a round of applause for the bill, I can hear you right now. Okay, thank you. And the committee knows we're going to make sure to input that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for your participation in today's public hearing on Bill 7135-LS. If you have any written testimony, you can email it to Senator Pidu at Senator Terlahi or jpterlahi.com or hand deliver it to my office at 140 Aspinall Avenue, Bridgepoint Building, Haganya, Guam. You know, when I say out, uh, when, I, when I give out my physical address, you know, people cannot find my office. So just look for uh, uh, Bank Pacific. Right across, you see that yellow building and right on top. So if you don't find me on that one empty space, you can go to the other side and you will find me for sure. The time now is currently, well, we say, we say 4 o'clock. Never mind. <laughs> she said 11 after 4. Never mind. My watch is saying 4 o'clock. <laughs> the time is currently 4, 4 o'clock. And the Committee on Public Safety, Border Safety, Military and Veterans Affairs, Marriage Council of Guam, Infrastructure and Public trans Transit is now adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful moment hearing, listening to you guys. Uh, and I think my colleague would also listen to me because, you know, let me just say this, uh, that I am the oldest senator and I don't ask them. I tell them to vote for the bill. <laughs>